me, climate change is one of the great challenges of the 21st century. In my view, we have four major challenges that we have to face in this century. Firstly, of course, climate change, which I'll explain a little bit more later on. But we also have to think about global poverty and the number of poor people uh, who don't have access to food or clean water in the world. We also have to think about environmental degradation because we're actually destroying the planet at the same time as we're changing the climate. And the last one is then global security. We have to actually look at all these to see how we can actually change the way we work, change the way we do industry, and change how we do some international politics to make sure in this century we can actually cure all of those. For me, climate change is at the nexus, the center of this. The problem is that since the Industrial Revolution, we've been burning fossil fuels. Now, don't get me wrong, fossil fuels are fantastic. They have produced a brilliant industrial lifestyle. They produce cheap energy. They've been able to allow us to make sure that water is clean, food is freely available, but it has a side effect. When we burn fossil fuels, they release greenhouse gases. Things such as carbon dioxide and methane, nitrous oxides and CFCs. And these have an unintended consequence. They're warming the atmosphere. So if we look at the atmosphere, climate change is really just simple physics. So at the moment, the sun shines on us and the light energy from the sun passes through the atmosphere, almost as if the atmosphere isn't there. All of it passes through, except a small amount, which is the ultraviolet radiation, gets absorbed by the ozone layer, which is fantastic because, of course, we all know that ultraviolet radiation causes skin cancer, can also do DNA damage. So it's great that we're protected by ozone. But most of the energy passes through. And some of it hits the snow cover, the clouds, and all the white surfaces and the light surfaces and get reflected back into space. So a third of all the sun's energy goes straight back into space without actually hitting the ground. And then the other two thirds hits the ground and converts. We have all know this because we've all lain out by a swimming pool on a, not, a lovely hot summer's day and the sun's energies hit us and we feel hot because the solar energy is converting to heat and then radiating off our bodies. And the same happens to the earth. Now that heat radiates off of the earth and this is where the greenhouse gases come in. The water vapor, the CO2 and the methane capture a little bit of this heat and hold on to it for a little while and then release it which actually keeps our planet nice and warm. If we stripped out all the greenhouse gases, we took out water vapor, CO2 and methane from the atmosphere and took it all out, the temperature of the Earth would drop by about 35 degrees Celsius. That would mean the average temperature in the tropics would be minus 15, too cold to actually produce food or for us to actually survive in a proper, nice way. So greenhouse gases have kept the world nice and habitable. But the problem is we're putting some extra in there. And we've been doing this since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And so what's happened is that by burning fossil fuels in our cars, in our power stations, and also by changing the way we use the land, and we're basically re cutting down forests, changing our land into agricultural land, we're releasing more of those gases. And that has started to warm up the planet. So we know that over the last 100 years, we've increased carbon dioxide by about 40%, and we've doubled methane. And that has led to a temperature change of nearly one degrees Fahrenheit, which is actually quite a significant warming. And that is why we're worried about climate change, because it changes the rules on which our planet climate is based. One of the interesting things about our carbon pollution, uh, particularly carbon dioxide and methane, is that not all of it is ending up in the atmosphere. We've been very fortunate that for every ton of carbon dioxide we pump into the atmosphere, half of that is being taken out by the planet. Now, a quarter is going into the oceans, so the oceans are absorbing the CO2 and unfortunately acidifying. So despite the oceans helping us with these uh, pollution, it's also acidifying and causing problems for corals and for other small organisms that build calcium carbonate shells. The other quarter is being absorbed by the land biosphere, mainly the forests, particularly in the boreal and high latitude areas and in the tropical rainforests. 
Now, the things that scientists are worried about is, of course, that's great, but at some point, the oceans, because they're warming up, can hold less gases, and particularly less CO2, so they may start to hold less gas and therefore stop to take up less of our pollution. And also, if we look at the biosphere, we all know that, of course, we are constantly cutting down rainforest for actually agriculture. We're changing sort of uh, forests around the world in North America and in Europe. And so, therefore, the actual propensity for that uh, biosphere to actually absorb carbon dioxide is redu reducing every year. So we cannot rely on that. So one thing scientists are worried about is we A, have to actually cut our carbon emissions and drop it down rapidly over the next few years, but we also need to be worried about whether nature is still going to be absorbing some of our pollution. Scientists are also worried about what we call positive feedbacks. So one of the problems is that we're worried about the Arctic sea ice retreating. And we know that uh, 2008 and 2012 were some of the most extreme retreats of sea ice that we've seen in the Arctic Ocean since records began. The problem there is that, of course, white sea ice reflects sunlight into the atmosphere. Now, of course, if you have dark ocean instead of sea ice, then what happens is more heat is absorbed. And we call this the Arctic amplification. So when we're predicting the future of climate change, the interesting thing and worrying thing is the Arctic and the Antarctic seem to warm up twice as much as the tropics because of these uh, positive feedbacks. One of the consequences of climate change is that the planet is warming up but that also warms up the oceans. And of course, we all know if you heat up a liquid, it expands. And so we are worried about sea level rise because we've already documented that over the last 100 years, the average sea level of the whole globe has increased by about 25 centimeters. Now that may not sound very much, but if you think about it, that allows storm surges to be slightly higher and slightly more extreme. What we're looking at into the future is more thermal expansion of the ocean because of this heating up. And also because Antarctica and Greenland are starting to melt, more water is being added into the oceans. Now there is one thing that is uh, least worrying about sea level change is it is very slow. So at the moment, we're thinking that sea level change is about three millimeters per year, which is incredibly small. But of course, over a decade, over two decades, over 50 years, if that starts to accelerate, it will have a huge effect. So we can see that perhaps by the end of this century, we're looking at a meter rise in sea level, which is going to have a profound influence on coastlines, whether it is protecting coastlines, eroding coastlines. And the other problem is, of course, many of the storms that we're worried about, whether it's winter storms or hurricanes, the storm surge that's created, if the baseline is already a meter higher than it was, then we're going to have a much we're, we're going to have a, a more devastation inland because of that. But the key thing about sea level rise is we'll be able to see it coming because we can measure it and we can start to see when it accelerates. There is not going to be this massive sudden change as the Hollywood movies show that suddenly over five years we're going to get a meter. No, but it's a long-term problem that we will see it coming, but we'll need to plan for it and actually protect our people from that rise. Climate change is also worrying us because we're looking at extreme weather events. So extreme weather is when a weather event goes beyond what we expect. Now, the interesting thing is if there was a hurricane in Antarctica, now it's not going to happen because it's in the wrong place, but if a hurricane did happen in Antarctica, we really wouldn't care because there's no people living there, there's no property, and so therefore the interaction between humans and the weather isn't important. What we are worried about is where there are people, the actual baseline, how we predict climate, is starting to change. What we all forget about is that, of course, every society has what I call the coping range. So, for example, in the UK, um, temperatures above 26 degrees Celsius, which is about 88 degrees Fahrenheit, we start to have heat-related deaths. 
Now, of course, here in Florida, um, that's called spring. Okay? So again, different societies have different sort of uh, coping zones. And what happens is, as climate changes underneath, those extreme events seem to become more common because they actually start to go beyond the ability of that society to cope. An example of this is the floods that happened in Louisiana in 2016. Now, of course, studies by uh, NOAA suggest that these floods are now twice as likely to occur because of climate change, which means that we have to adapt as society to be able to cope with those increased floods. If we look at California, the drought of 2013 and 14 was extreme, but we know that these are going to become more likely. So what we have to do is adapt each of the societies to be able to cope with a greater range of natural variation. And that's something that people forget about climate change. They see the long-term trends, but they don't see that actually what really affects humans is not the average temperature or the average rainfall. It's the extreme events, whether it's heat waves, whether it's droughts, or whether it's floods. In many ways, climate change is about too much or too little water. We see that we are worried about uh, flooding, sea level rise, but we also on the other side we're worried about too little water. We're looking in a future whereby perhaps one and a half billion people will become water stressed. And we find that it's not just the countries in, say, the tropics in, say, sub-Saharan Africa, but we're also looking at countries such as the United Kingdom and in parts of the United States, whereby the water that we expect normally is suddenly shrinking. And somehow we need to adapt to actually produce enough water for the humans that are actually living in that area. And these can be predicted. We are using models for the future to give policymakers some idea of the range of uh, warming, the range of rainfalls, what are likely to happen with extreme events. So different countries and governments can start to predict and to adapt and also help to protect their population. We call this adaptation because unfortunately climate change is going to occur even if we do everything we can now, we're still looking at perhaps two degrees warming by the end of the century, which will mean there is climate change. So therefore, governments must be mandated to adapt to help protect their populations from the worst effects of climate change. Climate change also affects people's health. Now, I was very fortunate in 2009, I was part of a multidisciplinary team with engineers, medics, lawyers, climatologists that worked on the Lancet Commission. And we were looking at the interaction between climate change and global health because there's been huge advances in health uh, around the world over the last 50 to 60 years. But a lot of this could be undone by climate change. So let's have a look at it. So for us, the most important thing about health is access to clean water and food. Now, climate change threatens that. So if we look at water, we know that some areas could get more water, but in short, intense bursts, other areas are going to get less water. So we need to be able to manage that lack of water or too much water at the wrong times to be able to store it safely to allow people to still continue to have clean, fresh drinking water. Of course, water is absolutely essential for agriculture. And so therefore, if we don't manage the water in these areas and the changing availability of water, we won't be able to manage food production. Now, food production is absolutely essential, and most of the food in the world is produced by small farm holders. Now, the interesting thing is the Green Revolution that occurred in the 60s and 70s, which revolutionized food production in Southeast Asia and South America, meant that small farmers were able to produce enough food to feed themselves, but also to sell food on to the local towns, the villages, and the cities. And many people, about half the population of the world, were actually fed by this system. The big worrying thing is that in the tropics, if climate change does accelerate, we have conditions whereby it is too hot and too humid to work outside. There is a physiological limit whereby it is impossible to do heavy agricultural work outside. 
Now, we seem to forget this sometimes uh, in Europe and in the United States because, of course, when we're farming and we're out uh, in our farms, we have air-conditioned tractors. And so, therefore, we can actually work in all conditions, whatever the temperature, whatever the actual humidity. But actually, majority of the farmers in the world that produce the food for the very poorest people, the bottom uh, three and a half billion, they work outside. So the interesting thing is that when we looked at the health effects of climate change, food production and food security were really important. And we're very worried about, in 50 years' time, whether enough food will be able to be produced because we're losing all those days when people simply cannot go outside to actually work. The problem with food production and predicting it into the future is that climate change is only one of the issues facing food production. People seem to forget that actually when you have starvation and you have famines, actually it's not always a lack of food that's caused that. It's about a lack of money. So again, one of the most upsetting things is when the Ethiopians had those droughts and huge famines in the 1980s. When they first started off, there was grain still in the villages and in the towns, but the farmers whose crops had failed had no money to buy food. So the problem here when we talk about climate change and its adverse effect on food production, one of the key things here is, well, how does the World Trade Organization, how does international trade and food actually get distributed? I'll give you an example. The majority of uh, countries in Europe import a huge amount of food. They also export it. And so if a crop fails, say, in the United Kingdom or in the United States, you just go onto the international market and you buy food in because you have the money to buy that food. What is interesting and important is how do we have food security? So India has tried to push through a set of laws because they want to protect their food production. What they want to be able to do is say to all their small farmers, which they have many, many millions, and say, look, okay, we want you to produce food. We're going to give you a fair price for your food. Okay, so therefore, you still have money. You can still buy extra food, and you're not going to starve. So we'll buy that food. We will then subsidize that food and sell it at a subsidized rate to people who cannot afford food, so we actually do not have starving people. It's a wonderful idea, happened post-war in many countries after the Second World War to actually produce, uh, protect foods and actually allow food to be given out to everybody so there wasn't starvation. However, the World Trade Organization has taken uh, India to their courts, uh, led by the United States, because of course this is protected, uh, a protected uh, um, sort of uh, business. How can you do that? Because then other international uh, companies can't sell food into that market because the Indians are protecting and subsidizing food prices. So we then have this real problem here about whether international trade or protecting a population from starvation is more important. And the problem is with the weight of uh, transnational corporations and big heavyweight uh, Western countries, sometimes, unfortunately, the trade option wins over the protection. And we need to start looking at these things, particularly as climate change starts to get more intense in the future, about changing this balance. And that sometimes world trade is not the most important thing, but protecting the food and water of a population to prevent starvation is perhaps more important. So if we s sum up, climate change, there's a lot of evidence that it's already happening. We know that temperatures for the globe have increased by about one degree Celsius over the last hundred years. We know sea level has risen by about 25 centimeters. And we have lots of evidence for retreating sea ice in the Arctic, uh, reduced snowfall in the northern hemisphere. And so we have lots of evidence that climate change is already happening. What is key is what will happen in the future. And this is where scientists rely on climate models. So there are about 30 groups of brilliant scientists around the world in different uh, countries all who have produced independent models. Now these are supercomputers. I mean, these are the computers that predict your uh, weather and actually allow you to have some clear understanding of what's going to happen over the next couple of days. But we use these on a global scale 
and we actually map out what's going to happen in the future. Now, for me, the science in those models is exceptional. We understand thermodynamics, we understand how water moves around, we understand the basic principles. The one problem we have is not the science, it's actually the social science. How much carbon will people emit in the next hundred years? How many people will there be? How will we trade? What will happen? And there, what we do is we build scenarios, or what I call stories. So these are future stories about how humans are going to develop. And so if we think about it, there are about three really important ones. The first one is the business as usual. This is the one that we continue to accelerate our emissions as we're doing at the moment, and that carries on up. Now this one, if we look at the models, suggests that by the end of the century, we could warm up the planet between four and six degrees, which is a huge amount of warming compared with, say, the one degree we've done over 100 years. And that's quite a frightening scenario, and really most scientists have no intention of allowing the world to go there. Then there's a middle one which says, OK, we try to do some things to it, and we actually end up with about two to three degrees. And then there's one scenario which the politicians asked us to work on. They said, look, at Copenhagen in 2009, uh, we suggested that we would keep the world to only two degrees warming. Can you please tell us how to do that? And so we built scenarios that show how we get there. Now, what's fantastic is that in Paris, in December 2015, 193 countries of the UN sat down and agreed that we are going to cut global emissions, we are all going to take responsibility, and we are going to deal with climate change in an internationally coordinated way, which is fantastic. But to do that, is a really big challenge. The first thing is that emissions can only increase up to the year 2020. After that, they have to start to drop. And they have to drop at about 3% per year. So that's almost more than we're increasing now every single year. And we have to carry that on every single year. By 2070, what we then have to do is we then have to have negative emissions. We actually have to start sucking CO2 out of the atmosphere to actually allow the, uh, the amount of greenhouse gases to stabilize at a low enough level that we can guarantee that we're under uh, two degrees Celsius. So this is a huge ask for the future, but if you think about it, there is actually nothing technologically that would stop us doing it. And in many ways, if we actually move to more renewable sources of energy, we would have better energy security because we wouldn't be reliant on fossil fuels from other countries. We can control our own energy. And again, we have a lack of air pollution because, of course, we know that coal-fired power stations cause a lot of air pollution. And of course, it will be our own power and actually the technology would generate huge amounts of jobs and also a lot of income. And so the key thing there is moving our world into a green economy and actually driving this forward and actually producing a better country, a better world, and keeping the climate to only two degrees. One of the big questions is, if we don't have fossil fuels, what should we use? Now, of course, there are lots of different renewable energies. So we can use solar. And the interesting thing about solar, which is every time the world's uh, production of solar panels doubles, the actual cost per unit drops by about 12.5%. So at the moment, the cost of solar is coming down very quickly. We can also use wind power because, again, we can actually plant, uh, and I love the term plant, uh, turbines, particularly out at sea, to catch the best wind. That's fantastic. We can use tidal because, of course, that's then constant. And then, of course, we can also, in the interim, we can use fossil fuel power stations but capture the CO2 and make sure it doesn't make it into the atmosphere. So there are lots of technologies. The one area which is the biggest challenge, though, is not energy production, because we can do that. It's actually transport. Because in many countries, we are wedded to our cars and to our aeroplanes. And so are, are we able to shift our mindset? Now, again, the interesting thing is that electric cars are coming of age. 
Most of you have seen the wonderful uh, supercars like the Porsche or the McLarens. Now these are hybrids. So of course, for the first uh, 0-60, you use the battery engine because it has incredible torque and therefore 0-60 in about 2.6 seconds. I want one of those cars. After the 60 miles an hour, of course, you then switch to the petrol engine then to take it up to the 200, 250 miles an hour. But if we look at other electric cars, uh, the Prius, uh, the Leaf, um, the Tesla, these cars are now affordable and work. So actually just changing the mindset and actually changing the cars um, is going to be an easy thing to happen. One of the things though that is a challenge I think is of course air travel. Kerosene is an amazing invention. Again, developed during the Second World War, and actually more money was spent in the United States developing aerofuels than it was on the Manhattan Project and the nuclear bomb. The key thing is that this fuel gives a huge energy release for a small weight, which means you can fly a jumbo jet over the Atlantic. But there are some really good alternatives. If you're in the US, one of the key things that America 2050 suggests is high-speed rail. Now what they've identified is that eight major city hubs that should act as centers for high-speed trains. You can then start to lay down uh, magnetic levitation trains which would give you an average speed of 300 miles an hour. And you would then have these networks because most people only fly between small short distances in the US. Very, uh, there isn't a huge east to west or west to east, it's mainly up and down each of the coasts or in, actually in the middle. So again, there's this wonderful network you could build. At the moment, the US only has about 400 miles of high-speed rail network. That's about the same as Germany, okay? Now, the Chinese are building over 11,000 miles of high-speed uh, trains. And again, this is one of the key things is of changing the mindset. Because the US have done this before, okay? So after the Second World War, Eisenhower looked at Germany and worked out that Germany kept fighting for the whole war even though we carpet bombed them because they had a distributed industrial base, because the factories were everywhere. When you look to the US, all the factories were concentrated in the Northeast, around Connecticut and all those big uh, industrial complexes. He was worried about that because if there was bombing, that could have been taken out. So he put in the Highways Act, which, if you do it with modern uh, costings, cost something like $580 billion to build the highway network around the US. Absolutely fantastic. Now, did it distribute the uh, industry as Eisenhower wanted? Well, not, not as he wished. However, that federal money changed the way the Americans moved around. So again, putting similar amounts of money in to build high-speed rail networks would change the way Americans think. The idea that you can literally walk into Grand Central Station with your bag, hop on a train, 300 miles an hour gets you to Washington or down to sort of Florida. Okay, that's the simple way. We do this in Europe. I mean, I hop on a train in London. It's a high-speed train. It takes me to Paris. Okay, it takes two and a half hours. Bang. Okay, so again, even in a small area such as Europe, we have these very good networks. And I think that American 2050 has a brilliant vision for how the US could actually evolve into that sort of uh, post-fossil fuel economy. What I've always been aware of is the fossil fuel industry will use any excuse to try to actually derail renewable energy. And it's not surprising, if you actually think about the fossil fuel industry in the world, they have huge subsidies. At the moment, uh, the International Monetary Fund has estimated that the fossil fuel industry globally has about $5 trillion of subsidies per year. That's about the same amount of money that we spend on healthcare in the whole world. So again, we're looking at an industry which is artificially cheap because of those subsidies. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not because the private companies like a Chevron or BP are getting huge subsidies. It's basically because out of the 25 largest fossil fuel companies, only nine of them are privately owned. The others are either state 
or part state owned. And of course, if you happen to be Norway and you own your own national oil company, then of course you're going to give them tax breaks, you're going to give them sort of advantages because of the tax revenues you get in. So the problem that we have here is the fossil fuel industry, when we target sort of like private companies, that's not the issue. We need to target governments and the government-owned companies, which are some of the largest in the world. But it also means that we get a lot of rhetoric about sort of, hey, we'll look at uh, renewable uh, energy, look at the batteries, look at the uh, uh, rare earth elements that are required for sort of uh, uh, these new sort of fangled solar panels. But that's a false economy because we know that when new technology comes along, at first, of course, we try to actually make it as cheap as possible, and then the price comes down when you start to sell more and more units. We also know that when you actually get new products, we have new ways of recycling and actually changing the products within there. In Europe, we have a very extensive piece of legislation called REACH, and it uh, was a finally agreed after 10 years of negotiation in 2009. And what it does, it mandates the levels of contaminants in goods sold in the EU. So this is things like heavy metal contamination, rare earth elements, and things like that. And therefore, it is there to protect the people. And what's interesting is scientists will give them a, a level and say, well, this is about the safe level we think of mercury or sort of uh, silver in a particular product. And actually, what the Europeans have done is actually pushed it lower. Now, this caused consternation in the United States because the, uh, uh, the US chemistry, uh, chemical industry sent lobbyists over to Brussels. Unfortunately, us Europeans don't understand lobbying, so of course it had no effect because it means that any product that is sold in Europe has to abide to these regulations. So if you happen to be an American company, you're producing stuff in America, in South America and Australia, you're putting it all together and then you're putting it into the European market as well as selling everywhere else, all those factories have to be cleaned up and your contamination has to be incredibly low. So it means that by the back door, Europe has actually helped to start clean up some of these high levels of contaminants that we find in different products. And what is key then is that then goes back to renewables that says, well, hang on, guys. We know that these have particular elements that are required. They have particular things that could be problematic and poisonous. But under the EU regulations, they have to be controlled and recycled and looked after to protect the rest of the environment. What I find sometimes concerning is because there are very strong emotions in climate change and there are very strong and highly paid lobbyists, you get a lot of misinformation. So one of these classic cases is wind turbines kill birds. Now there's a recent study that just came out that actually showed that wind turbines had no effect on golden eagles. Okay, Rigorous, uh, long-term study to actually show that. And actually, one of my friends who used to work for the fossil fuel industry uh, was very cross about uh, this whole rhetoric about wind turbines. He used to work on oil rigs. Now, oil rigs, of course, every so often get permission to flare. And basically, what you do is you burn the gas off the top for safety reasons. Now, of course, what it means is that for days and days on end, you have this huge jet of flame coming out of your uh, oil platform. And guess what? It attracts birds. And as he said, basically, they were incinerating hundreds and hundreds of birds every single week. And so a key thing is that when you look at the rhetoric, you have to balance it because you have to ask, why are these people trying to put you off nice wind turbines out at sea, producing lots of clean electricity that allow you to actually reduce the effects of climate change? Many people include uh, nuclear power within the sort of renewable energy family. Now, we have to actually look at this in a quite a serious way because different countries have decided to go down that route. So, for example, about 80 to 90 percent of all the electricity generated in France is from nuclear power stations. And many other countries are thinking about renewing their power stations and actually generating clean uh, electricity from nuclear.
Now, the interesting thing for me, personally, is I think this is a democratic decision, that countries have to decide for themselves whether they wish to actually go down that route. So, for example, Germany has always voted with their feet and have said no nuclear. Japan has gone for nuclear, and so has France. But let me actually extract some of the facts about nuclear. So the big problem with nuclear is that everybody assumes that it's carbon neutral. But the first thing is you have to remember is that a nuclear power station is really just a huge, massive ball of concrete, which is a huge carbon footprint in its own right. The actual fuel stuff has to actually then be mined, the uranium has to be brought, so that has a part of a carbon footprint. And then, this is the problem facing France. You then have to decommission those nuclear power stations something like 40 years after they have been built. Now the problem there is, what do you do with decommissioning all of that concrete and all of that uh, material which is radioactive and has to be stored for 10,000 years before it's safe? And no one's actually really worked out how much work you have to do to actually protect that. There's also another problem. Um, Japan has a wonderful system to protect themselves against earthquakes and tsunamis, but even their incredibly advanced uh, system, when they were hit by the tsunami, their nuclear power station of Fukushima was actually damaged. And again, the local area had to be evacuated. So again, the problem is that societies have to decide whether nuclear power is worth the risk or whether Actually, if you go down the solar, the tidal, and actually perhaps the wind route, you might have a much cheaper option in the long term and actually a safer option. One of the key things is that we now know that many countries are locked into a fossil fuel economy. Again, fossil fuels are very cheap because of the subsidies. Many countries have reserves, so they can actually use that. And again, if you think about it, people need energy for their livelihoods, for clean water, and for uh, industry. So again, you have to balance the need of the energy versus the actual availability of um, the fuel. Now, one of these solutions could be that in the short term we could have carbon capture and storage. What that means is, okay, you can have a power station, perhaps using uh, natural gas or uh, methane from fracking, but you capture the CO2 after you've burnt the gas, you then capture the CO2 in the fumes, and then what you do then is you then pump that and store it. Now, the interesting thing is the oil industry has been using carbon dioxide for tens of years. Because what they do is when you get to the end of a reserve underwater or uh, uh, in the ground, what you do is you start to pump carbon dioxide into the reservoir to get the last gas and the last oil out of the reserve. You then fill up the reserve with CO2 and then you cap it off. So there are places, deep places in oil wells, in saline aquifers, that we could store quite a lot of CO2. Now the interesting thing is this is great, but at the moment we don't have a proper industrial scale example to show A, whether it works, B, how much it will cost, and therefore what we need to do is have these examples around the world to show whether car carbon capture and storage would work, and also then make sure it's safe. Because one thing you must remember, carbon dioxide is an incredibly dangerous gas. The problem is it's heavier than air. So if you release a very large amount of it, it sits near the ground. And of course, it's because it's uh, dense and therefore excludes the other gases, can be very, very dangerous for human and animal health because then it prevents people actually breathing. There was an example in sort of uh, Cameroon, a volcano, uh, basically was slowly bubbling into the lake, calm dioxide, and the water was coming super saturated in calm dioxide. Nobody knew this. And then one day what happened in 1988 was there was a landslide which mixed up all the water and all the gas then came out, came down the hill, floated over the villages, and 2,000 people suffocated and so did all their livestock. So we know that concentrated carbon dioxide is a danger, so we need to make sure that not only do we capture it, 
we transport it safely, and we make sure we definitely store it safely that it can't come back out. Many people, particularly scientists and politicians, are concerned that even though we have now pledged to start reducing uh, carbon emissions, we may not be doing it quick enough. And so they're looking at alternative, the plan B. And what you find is people always talk about geoengineering. Now, geoengineering is a term which covers a multitude of sins. And again, I'm going to try and take those apart for you so you can see the good, the bad, and the absolutely insane. Okay? So geoengineering starts off with, well, how do we actually capture carbon, take it out of the atmosphere? So the first thing is that many people see that reforestation, replanting, rewilding of our um, planet would be incredibly good. I do a lot of work in East Africa, and when I fly up the Rift Valley, I look out, and my students look at the landscape, and they go, oh, wow, this is a savannah. I go, no. We're a 1,000 meters above sea level. It should be forest. And what you find is that you see clouds of dark figures on the landscape. Those are goats and cattle. And what you find is that they basically have deforested the whole area. And you find that you have very low grass and a few very large trees. And so we have vast areas of Africa, of Europe, North America, and of course uh, China that we could reforest. And actually planting trees is a fantastic way of actually taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and converting it into basically plants. It also has another advantage. Um, China had a huge problem in the 1990s, which was the uh, lowest plateau had turned into a dust bowl. They had overworked it very much like the 1920s in the USA, and therefore the farmers weren't being able to produce food. This had been, this had been the breadbasket of China for the last 3,000 years. They asked the scientists, and the scientists said, well, look, all the trees have been cut down. This has actually caused huge problems. So they mandated that each person with their farm had to replant and start planting trees. Within a decade, Firstly, the soils were stabilized because you had the trees holding in the soils, so therefore the agriculture could actually start up again. And what also was amazing is because trees transpire, they put moisture back into the atmosphere, you start to moisten the atmosphere and actually you make rainfall locally more regular and actually more controllable. And so it's interesting that reforestation has positive effects, not just on climate change, not just on local uh, climate, but also the water cycle as well. But those are some of the positive ones for geoengineering. The other ones are things like carbon capture and storage, where take CO2 out of the industrial process as it's being uh, produced, and then storing it. And then there's the more far-fetched ones. So, for example, there are some uh, scientists that are suggesting we should have plastic trees. These trees have a special secret coating, which between you and I is caustic soda. And, of course, when it, uh, um, uh, air blows over it, CO2 is absorbed by the caustic soda. You can then take those down, and then you can wash it, and the uh, CO2 goes into the water. Now, of course, I asked the question, what happens if it rains? Because then you lose all of that. So they then told me they'd need umbrellas over the plastic trees to stop the rain. So as you can see, some of these ideas aren't quite as well thought through as you would hope. The other ones, and these are the ones that we definitely need to avoid. These are the ones that say, hey, look, the planet's going to warm up. How do we cool the planet down? So one of them is, well, why don't we shoot lots and lots of small mirrors into space, okay? We'll throw them up there, and these little mirrors will start to reflect sunlight away from the planet. Therefore, we get less sunlight, so the planet cools. That's great. So what you're doing is you're changing the re reflectivity of the Earth and cooling it down. But what these people don't understand is you may get the average temperature down, but it's not the same planet. So when we've done models of this, what happens is, of course, the poles still warm up and the tropics cool down, so you have a completely different world. You don't have the same world, and therefore you're changing climate just as much as if you hadn't actually put them up there. I'm very lucky. Uh, my day job is a climatologist, but I'm also a paleoclimatologist, so I study past climates. And one of my passions is actually looking at the climate records as we go back in time. And one of the defining features of the last two and a half million years 
is that we've cycled in and out of these huge ice ages. Now, if we go back 18,000 years ago, we had uh, huge ice sheets uh, across the Northern Hemisphere. So we look at North America, we have the Laurentide Ice Sheet, and actually it was three kilometers thick over Chicago. We then go to um, uh, Europe, we see that we had the Scottish Ice Sheet, which was a couple of kilometers thick, and the Fenno-Scandinavian one as well. And then about 11,000 years ago, in the natural cycle of things, these ice uh, sheets melted and we came into a very stable interglacial period that we call the Holocene. So the last 11,000 years, we've had incredibly stable climate. Now for me, the most important thing was at the beginning of that, humans, as soon as we came out of an ice age, spontaneously in four different locations around the world, went from being hunter-gatherers to actually domesticating animals and plants to then start agriculture. And this occurred in the Americas, in Africa, in the Middle East, and in China. Completely separate, different species, no communication. So we came out, and we've had this wonderful, stable period. Now, the interesting thing about interglacials is there is a slow cooling through an interglacial and then actually we would be expecting, if we weren't interfering with the climate, perhaps we would be starting to drop into the next ice age in the next thousand years or so. And so there is this cooling curve. And we know that in the 1970s, uh, many scientists were concerned about this and perhaps we were on the cusp of this. But that was because of a lack of real understanding of the fine detail of how climate changes. And so what we now know is that greenhouse gases changed early on in this Holocene period. We've seen that CO2, instead of continuing down as it usually does in other interglacials, about 6,000 years started to go up. About 5,000 years ago, methane started to go up. And what we think happened now was the early agriculturalists, those pastoralists, actually changed the greenhouse gases. So we think the small, and it's only a very small increase of CO2, was due to deforestation and the spread of agriculture throughout the world. And we think the methane is actually partly because of the huge amount of wet rice agriculture that was occurring in China. And this then had this slow increase, and that small increase in uh, greenhouse gases, which is incredibly small compared with what we've done in the last hundred years, was just enough to make sure that our planet wasn't actually going to drop into the next ice age. But one of the really interesting questions is, are we in a new geological period? Are we actually in what we call the Anthropocene? Have we stopped the ice ages? Now, we don't know, but a key thing is if we keep this climate change going up, then maybe we will have changed the natural cycles and we will have prevented the next ice age. But actually we're going to cause ourselves huge amounts of problems because it's the speed that we're changing climate which is uh, exceptional in geological history. A lot of people that study climate change uh, sometimes despair because of course the world has been very slow to react. Again, we've been talking about climate change for the last 35 years, we've been showing evidence, we've been showing even more evidence, and it's taken a long time for politicians and for people to actually realize the underlying science is solid and that actually we are causing a problem to the planet and more importantly to ourselves. But I'm an optimist. What I see is that we humans are incredibly adaptable. We are incredibly inventive. We have technology that we can produce. Actually, all that's holding us back at the moment from actually dealing with climate change and dealing with the other issues around the world is that we are now still locked into political systems, both internationally and at the national level, that were set up in the middle of the 20th century. Now, the interesting thing is that these were fantastic. So after the Second World War, the Allies sat down and built a new world. They'd spent 10 years previously working out how the peace could actually work out. So the World Bank, the UN, the International Monetary Fund were all set up at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1945. Key starts to the modern world. 
They also said that, of course, the dollar should be the international currency, and this will make you laugh that basically one dollar was set at the gold standard of 35 ounces. Oh, now it's worth a lot more than that now. But we've now moved into the 21st century, and we know that these systems are not suitable for the 21st century. So what we now need to do is look at our world as a collective, realize that humans are actually controlling the environmental destiny and the evolutionary destiny of the only place in the universe that we know life exists, and actually say, okay, how are we going to make sure that we look after the 10 billion people that will be here by 2050? How do we look at the environment? And how do we actually think we can actually survive this century in the best way? Now, again, we've done it in the 20th century, we reinvented ourselves and reinvented human society. So we can definitely do it again in the 21st century. So I'm an optimist, and in many ways, I think that things like climate change, which are massive challenges for us, actually will bring the best out in humanity.